Stevens. Um, welcome to the Doyle's W. Stevens Scholarship Program. Um, I want to give a little bit of kind of background on what this program is all about before we launch in. Um, so this, for those of you who aren't already aware, um, this scholarship program was established by Friends of Great Salt Lake in 2003. Um, and it's basically a scholarship in recognition of our ongoing research related to Great Salt Lake in our community. And then it, increasingly in other um, states too, there have been projects in, um, from students in other states who are just interested in Great Salt Lake all, all from all around, which is really exciting. Um, and the prize is named after Doyle W. Stevens, um, who had a 20 year career working at the US Geological Survey. Um, during his time, he made significant contributions to our understanding of Great Salt Lake. Um, and this included foundational studies describing the um, biota in the lake, as well as the hydrology and drivers of salinity. So um, just to kind of give you a rundown of the schedule, first we'll hear presentations from our two um, 2020 awardees, um, undergraduate um, Melissa Coho, followed by a presentation by Molly Blankowski. Um, and there will be time for questions um, after each of those presentations. And we're gonna field the questions through the chat box. Um, and there's a couple of just kind of like housekeeping items as, um, professional Zoomers by now, you all know to please uh, mute your microphones. And then the other item is that we are planning to record this presentation and post it online so that folks can see it later. Um, so take that information and um, behave accordingly. Um, so with that, um, I want to, uh, let's see, I guess I'll go ahead and um, Oh, and one more item on the schedule is that the final, of course, the final part of this program will be announcing the 2021 winner. So we'll hear from what the 2020 um, awardees were up to, and then we'll kind of announce at the end who has won this year. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Soren Brothers, who will um, kind of give a nice intro for Melissa um, um, Coho. Hi hey everyone, thanks. Thanks Rose and um, thanks Lynn for inviting me to do this. Uh, I had in my notes a, a two minute introduction written down and I just saw on this agenda that is five minutes and I was already like, what am I gonna say for two minutes? But there's a lot I can say for, about Melissa. Um, I'll just have to say it really slowly for it to stretch out the five minutes. Um, no, but it's, it's been great working with Melissa Gobo. Uh, I actually first met Melissa as an undergraduate student at USU. I think she may have set a record for how quickly she graduated her undergraduate degree. Maybe you can correct me, Melissa, but I think she did it in less than three years and was still here in Logan. And it was, uh, I think, February 2020. I, started looking for, for someone to join my lab immediately. Melissa and I spoke and she started right in March 2020, um, which was a fortuitous time, as everyone knows, to start a new project where you're going to have to be working with people and meeting people and um, the pandemic hit. And so we had a really interesting first campaign, you know, it was April, I was out in the field teaching her these dry flux techniques on the Great Salt Lake, and she's going to be talking all about this. Um, but uh, but it's been a, obviously a crazy year for everyone, but you can just imagine starting this project um, about halfway through, um, we got, or actually shortly after that, I got some funding from Forestry Fire State Lands, which also has gone to Melissa to study now, not just all of the dry flux emissions around the lake, but also the primary production of the lake. So she's doing kind of like two PhDs and one master's, which originally she was gonna try and do in less than two years. Um, and now at least we have her for two full years, or at least until the end of uh, spring 2022 is the plan. Um, but it's been really great having this, uh, this funding to help her uh, extend the project that she's been doing and getting these extra campaigns in with, um, with also the help of Macy Page, who's an undergraduate, who's also worked in Janice's lab. And I have a couple pictures. I don't know if, it, if, it's, if I should be sharing them or if that was uh, the plan, but okay. So this was our first, can everyone see that? 
at least so this was our first yes. campaign and within a month of, of starting you know and i think masks weren't even that popular yet in the grocery stores at that point it was kind of like well you know we, we drove separately down to great salt lake and and actually i should probably oops let me go back there i should give a big thanks to um melissa's partner casey i think who helped her with all of the campaigns after that um, because we weren't sure also about social distancing so she got a lot of um and of course i didn't want anyone to be in the field alone during that period um, but she was out there every two weeks doing the dry flux and then this is even from uh, a couple weeks ago on the great salt lake on the airboat in farmington bay when it was snowing uh, just to give an idea of the range of experiences and conditions that's Melissa on the right um, that she's been through. So I can't, I think it'd be hard pressed to find someone who spent more time on the lake, both the wet parts of the lake and the dry parts of the lake in the past year. And with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Melissa. And that's about five minutes. <laughs> Thank you for those pictures. <laughs> Um, okay, so I will share my screen. Okay. Sometimes technology is not my best friend, so I'm sorry if I <laughs> do something weird. Okay. Okay, can, I, can everybody see? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming and um, especially Friends of the Great Salt Lake for having me and listening to my presentation. Um, so my name is Melissa Kobo. I, I'm getting my master's in ecology and climate adaptation science at Utah State University. And I'm focusing on CO2 dry flux rates on the dry lake bed of the Great Salt Lake. My major advisor is Fern Brothers, as you already know. And he is in the Ecology Center and Watershed Sciences Department. So to introduce my project, I will be talking about why CO2 from CO2 fluxes from lakes are important, why CO2 emissions from dry lake beds are important, and why human desiccated lakes represent anthropogenic CO2 emissions that we should be accounting for. So we know that CO2 emissions from lakes are important because studies have shown us that lakes nat naturally emit CO2 to the atmosphere. So this graph by Cole et al. Um, that looked at around almost 2000 lakes around the world shows that lakes tend to be super saturated of CO2. So the dotted line represents the lake's equilibrium with the atmosphere of CO2. And the right left side of the screen shows the number of lakes that are undersaturated with CO2. And the right side of the screen on the figure shows the amount of lakes or the number of lakes that are oversaturated with CO2. And in this study, they found that 87% of their samples were super saturated with CO2. So meaning that the lake is transferring the CO2 to the atmosphere. So while we know that lakes are large emitters of CO2, our current CO2 emission estimates don't account for the emissions of the beds after the, the lake has dried. And if we account for these areas, then our CO2 emission estimates could be a lot higher than, than we are accounting for currently. So this is why it's important to look at CO2 emissions from dry beds, because some studies have estimated that accounting for these emissions, we could be increasing the global lake emission by six to 10%. So in this graph, um, dry lake beds are usually a natural phenomenon in most lakes, but when it comes to saline lakes, they are done because of anthropogenic water consumption. So it's something that we can control or we could make better if we uh, figured out how to divert less water. Um, so this graph by Wartsbo et al shows the percentage of maximum volume by time and it shows different saline lakes around the world that have that uh, 
decreasing trend because of water diversions. And locally, our saline lake has been drying since the 1860s. And so um, we have seen that about half of the water volume of the lake has decreased. And in this figure by Wordsville et al. as well, you can appreciate that um, the blue line represents where the water level would be if we hadn't diverted the water for human consumption. And the red, the red um, line represents the actual drying path of the lake because of our water diversions. So for the first chapter of my master's program, I'm looking at how important it, the Great Salt Lake is to the state of Utah's anthropogenic CO2 emissions and whether those should be accounting for it. And so I was trying to, I did this by quantifying the annual CO2 emissions from the dry lake bed. And I expected this to be variable because we knew that um, temperature was an important factor because of literature and there's a lot of temperature gradients. Then I looked at the physical drivers of CO2 fluxes because I thought salinity might be a big driver, even though some literature has, has um, talked about salinity maybe not being as important, but the literature that is out there right now doesn't account for the salinity gradients that we see in the Great Salt Lake. Um, and then I'm going to try and calculate the CO2 emissions from lake surface itself and to see if that could be offsetting the CO2 emissions that we are getting from the dry beds. So um, I, as you know, the Great Salt Lake is <laughs> the study area. Um, and then this image of, again, by Wardsbow et al, you can see the Great Salt Lake and you can see how 50% of is it's bed is already exposed. So um, that is part of one of the reasons I chose it because then I could test all those areas. Um, like I said, uh, Utah gets a lot of temperature. So it gets really hot in the summer, really cold in the winter. So I knew that a temperature gradient would be possible in this location. And then it also has a great salinity gradient because it has three major tributaries. There you go, ass chomp. You're the man. <laughs> um, so it has three rivers that are that are feeding into it. There are fresh water. Um, so the salinity will be different depending on the proximity of those of the area to those rivers. Um, so for the methods for my seasonality. Um, aspect of the project. I sampled every two weeks from April 2020 to November 2020 at the same nine sites in one location in the Great Salt Lake and took CO2 gas flux measurements. I recorded humidity, temperature, and other possible factors that I thought could be important. And I did soil characteristics in the lab um, to get things like pH and conductivity. And then to look at salinity gradients, I went on an intensive campaign that had different bays of the Great Salt Lake. It took pl place in different bays of the Great Salt Lake to capture that salinity. Um, and then I also added Utah Lake to be able to compare my samples from the Great Salt Lake to Utah Lake. That, would, that is a completely freshwater lake. And I also collected terrestrial vegetation um, or vegetation transects in each of these locations to look at terrestrial veg vegetation as a possible um, like relationship with offsetting that CO2 and to see if it had an, like a relationship with salinity in the dry beds. And then lastly, um, I've been trying to calculate lake CO2 emissions from surface water using dissolved inorganic carbon. So I've started analyzing some of my data and looking across seasons, we can see that temperature is a major driver of our CO2 fluxes. Um, you can appreciate how after like 20 degrees Celsius or higher than 20 degrees Celsius, CO2 fluxes start increasing dramatically. And something that's very interesting to see about this is that comparing these two graphs and note that the x axis are different. Um, this figure by Keller et al has 
58 lakes, they studied 58 lakes around the world. And the range that they have is very similar to the range that the Great Salt Lake has just in one system across seasons. So you can see how just one lake can be so variable across a whole season um, when you're comparing it to, to a study that has been done for lakes around the world. Um, then looking at the salinity aspect of my project, it didn't seem like salinity is a strong, has a strong relationship with CO2 fluxes, but when accounting for vegetation, um, it seems to be important. So vegetation can take in CO2 from the, from the atmosphere, but we can see vegetation only in the lower salinity areas. So the higher the salinity, the less the possibility the vegetation has to come back and the least it'll have to, um, as a possibility to take in that CO2 from the dry beds. So it seems like it could be an important aspect when accounting for vegetation. So looking at our data again, we can see that there is an important increase of CO2 during the middle of the summer. And the pre preliminary analysis of our data shows that there can be a 5.2 million tons of CO2 increase per year, um, assuming that 50% of the lake is dried as we've seen. That would add to the 59 million tons of CO2 per year that Utah already has. So roughly a 10% um, increase, nine to 10% increase but of anthropogenic CO2 emissions. Um, and this is assuming that this 9% assumes that there are zero lake fluxes, but since we can't make that assumption, we are trying to calculate the emissions that are coming from the lake. Um, and looking at Bear River Bay and Farmington Bay, which are areas that we were able to calculate lake CO2 fluxes because of its lower salinity, we saw that um, we could be increasing, these two areas could be acting as a sink, and when dried, we could be increasing this 9% estimate by a lot more, considering. So in summary, <laughs> Um, uh, this research, we, in this research, we found that CO2 fluxes in the Great Salt Lake and in the Great Salt Lake dry bed are as variable as global lake dry fluxes in just one system. Um, we saw that salinity may be an important driver of dry bed CO2 fluxes if we're accounting for terrestrial ve vegetation as a possible um, way of, of, of setting that CO2, those CO2 emissions and that anthropogenic desiccation may significantly increase Utah CO2 fluxes because from the lake and the dry bed. So thank you so much for listening to my presentation. <laughs> thank you so much, Melissa. Um, does anyone have, if anyone has questions for Melissa Kobo, can you put them in the chat? I have a question. Um, I'm curious about the different biota that might be occurring in the different kind of levels of the sites with different levels of salinity. Do you see evidence of kind of biotic soil crust or potentially a lot of organic matter in the, um, the sediment in different places? Like are there variations in the way that kind of this, the soil biota might be presenting? Um, so I noticed the soil be very different, um, but yeah, I feel like that's a little bit out of the scope of my research. <laughs> um, but yes, it was very variable within sites that I would study and the soil was very different between those sites. So. And um, Lynn DeFreitas has a question. Um, she's curious why you chose Utah Lake for your comparison. It was a nearby freshwater lake <laughs> that I could study and it did have some um, areas that had like a little dry bed that I could go and test with some terrestrial vegetation too. Awesome. And then um, Joy Emery is wondering, um, 
if you can explain the form of liquid, um, it was the third point of your earlier slides. And maybe Joy, if I'm not representing your question well, you can feel free to pipe in and clarify. Oh, I had a typo. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I just was wondering if you could help me understand the offset from the liquid. It was the third point on one of your first slides. So the um, dissolved and organic samples to collect, to uh, make calculations? I think so. <laughs> Sorry, I can go back to my slides. Oh, I stopped sharing. Um, third point in one of my slides. Oh yeah, one of them was uh, temperature was important because of temperature gradient. The second yeah. one was the physical drivers and then the last one was CO2 from liquid offset. Okay, yes. So I'm trying to calculate the CO2 that's coming from the lake itself. Um, and I'm trying to do that from water samples that I've collected in the lake and from like the dissolved and organic carbon. And I'm trying to do some calculations with with the numbers that I've gotten, but um, the salinity in the Great Salt Lake is so high that we haven't been able to find a calculation that accounts for for or gives us the results that we need. Um, that's why Bear River Bay and Farmington Bay were one of the ones that we were able to calculate because we calculate the PCO2 of the lake and um, and then measure that and look at like the different CO2 aspects of it. Um, and sorry, am I explaining that incorrectly? <laughs> I feel like I'm confusing them. Um, but yeah, so that's what we're trying to do. And we're trying to do it for the whole lake. But because the salinity is so high, it's been a little harder to, to do. Um, yeah, that's Thank a great question. Um, there's another question from Katie Newburn, who is um, asking what kind of tool do you use to measure the carbon flux? I use, uh, it's called a Picaro. It's a gas chamber. Um, it's actually in my presentation. I had a little picture of it that I closed out of accidentally, but I can show it. Um, and yeah, so it's a gas chamber and I just with like a little dome and I set it on the ground. Um, here it is, I'll share the screen again. Share my screen. Um, sorry. <laughs> so, oh, there it is. This is the Picaro I use, um, and then I put this little dome on the on the soil, and it measures the CO two fluxes in there. Awesome. Um, all right. So Kelly Hanna is asked. It says, "Great study. Does any or a certain amount of water stop CO two from emanating into the atmosphere, or does it just slow it down to some degree?" So, if there's water on top of the sediment, does that affect the flux to the atmosphere? Um, that's a little also over the scope of my study, <laughs> um, but I maybe, I think, um, I think like what, when, uh, like the, that study that they made where the lakes, um, would act as like a sink and would be undersaturated. Um, I don't know at which point the Great Salt Lake would become oversaturated with it, but then it would stop holding it in and flicking it through. So I think it would like hold it in for however long until it reaches that point where it's oversaturated. All right, and then um, Bonnie is asking uh, for a picture. Melissa is a hand model. I assume that's an inside joke. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa needs to stop sharing for a minute. Okay. I love so much when we get to have fun with new people in the field. And Melissa came out with us uh, last July with Soren. And um, so, I mean, look at her like rocking the whole like gear, but this is what I want to say. Like, I have a lot of pictures of hands holding <laughs> microbialites at Great Salt Lake, but check this out. 
Is that not like the best hands ever? And so in case the science thing doesn't work out, and I think it will because your science is awesome, but in case it doesn't, or in case you need some like a side hustle, I think hand modeling microbialite, um, you know. Might be a thing. <laughs> might be a thing. Anyway. I'll start I like that. putting lotion on my hands. <laughs> <laughs> That's no, my, my dream job was to be a science catalog model. So I think like, you know, this could, you know, maybe <laughs> at least have been to a side hustle. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic presentation. And what you're doing is so important. So I just want to say two thumbs up and kudos. And it's really fun to hear from you. Yeah, thank you so much. Do we have any, we don't have, I think we um, have had a few wonderful questions. If you have further questions for Melissa Kobo, um, maybe get in touch or maybe leave a message in the chat and we can revisit them later, but great job, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you. The silent claps here. Okay, to move along in our program, um, I'm going to now introduce um, Janice Brainy, who will introduce her student, Molly Blankowski, who was a, the um, graduate uh, awardee of the Doyle Stevens Scholarship in 2020. Hi, I have a picture to share of Molly. Oops. Okay, so Molly has a bachelor's in geological sciences and a master's in earth and environmental sciences, both from the University of Michigan. Her master's research focused on dust deposition as well as dust source tracking using isotopes. And she has worked through the Western United States as well as in Ar Antarctica. She has a lot of great stories from her field work. Um, from her work, her dust work at the University of Michigan, she has 10 peer reviewed publications, including in um, really high end journals like Science Advances and Nature Communications. After graduating from her master's, she worked in the private sector for a little while and taught geology and environmental science at uh, colleges in Michigan. She is currently doing her PhD at USU where she is looking at dust emissions uh, from and sources to the Great Salt Lake, which you will hear about in a lot more detail. And uh, as you can see from some pictures here, I would like to stress that this work is really difficult. So Molly has to work in some really, really hot conditions and sometimes in dust storms, walking over 20 miles in a day to collect her samples. So this is really, really intense work. Um, and we really appreciate the efforts that she's uh, giving to this project. So while being a PhD, she is also a physical scientist at the USGS um, through the Pathways program, where she is building a database to support dust-related research throughout the West. And um, she's also working on a few other dust-related projects through that work. Throughout her career, um, she has been awarded 11 awards and scholarships based on her, um, her stellar accomplishments. Um, and she is also, through all of this hard work, an avid volunteer. So while she was at the University of Michigan, she facilitated drop-in support groups and led workshops on sexual assault prevention. Um, at USU, she volunteers for the student food pantry and also coordinates our undergrad graduate mentorship program. Um, and so with that, I would love to let Molly take over and give her talk. Thanks, Janice. Uh, I do already have that embarrassing picture in my slideshow, but I'm glad that people have seen it uh, to begin with. Just gonna share my screen. I'm always bad at this, but can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. All right. Okay, hi, um, I'm Molly. Thank you so much, Janice, for that nice introduction. And I want to give a special shout out to my mom who is here in the room today. Uh, 
So I'm really grateful to have received the Doyle Stevens Scholarship last year. Uh, thanks so much to everyone who is involved for your generosity and support. Um, and I'll go ahead and talk to you about my research on dust from the Great Salt Lake Playa to continue our theme of dry lake bed research. Uh, as Melissa has already shown us, the Great Salt Lake is shrinking to increased human water use, so much so that the lake is currently around 50% of its former size. Now its dry lake bed has become a huge potential dust source area. This image of the southeastern portion of the lake right next to the Salt Lake City metro area where many of us live is from 2011. And here's the same view five years later change in between just five years and I downloaded a satellite image just a few days ago um, to see what it looked like and playa near Farmington Bay kind of looks about the same as it did during that record late breaking low in the fall of 2016 so I wouldn't be surprised if we hit a new record low this year. Uh, now if you're familiar with here it is it's already up I'm it's it comes up a lot uh, anyway, if you're familiar with the environmental disasters at Owens Lake or at the RLC, you know that a growing dust source that's located right next to one of the largest populations of my research include the fact that elevated levels of atmospheric particulates have negative health consequences that dust can cause physical or chemical changes to soils and plants downwind from the playa. And dust deposited on mountain snowpack accelerates melt, reducing regional water supplies, which we especially can't afford during droughts. These potential impacts become more severe when we're talking about a polluted dust source. So because the Great Salt Lake is a terminal lake, it accumulates contaminants from across the entire watershed. My collaborators in the chemistry department at USU are analyzing playa dust for organic contaminants like pesticides and PAHs. And my lab mate Austin Bartos analyzed dust from the playa for cyanotoxins. To round out the bunch, I'm really interested in heavy metal pollution. So that's a major focus of my PhD research. So speaking of my research, I'm going to tell you what I've done so far during this talk and then talk to you a bit about my ongoing work and goals. Since I got here in 2019, I've established my field sites and constructed different types of sampling equipment, collected dust samples from the playa for two field, for two field seasons, and I'm about to start my third. Um, I estimated dust flux from each of my sites. Uh, analyzed the heavy metal content of dust collected during the first field season and used air mass trajectory modeling to get a sense for where dust from the playa is being transported after it's generated. Finally, based on those preliminary data, I outlined my dissertation chapters and refined my major research questions. Quickly before I share my preliminary findings, I want to The samplers are pretty cool. There are canvas flags that can rotate with the direction of the wind. Um, there's bottles attached here at different heights. Um, and what happens is airborne sediments and dust come in through the inlet tubes and they deposit with the dust deposits within the bottle and then air flows back out the outlet tube. What these samplers are capturing is a mixture of saltation and suspension. So when a saltating sand grain that's just bouncing along the ground surface hits, um, hits the ground, it can eject smaller particles into suspension in the air. This are pretty good at sticking together, um, especially if they're protected by a mineral or biological surface crust. Uh, previous work has shown that the threshold wind velocity for the onset of saltation on playas could be between like 20 and 30 miles per hour. So this means that dust production mainly occurs during strong wind events. Uh, if I were crazy enough to playa every single day to collect samples, 
I probably find that not much material accumulates in my bottles on most of the days. And I stay crazy because Janice, as Janice mentioned, these sites are very remote. Daily sampling is not really a logistically possible situation. So although the walk to Antelope, right, uh, the Antelope Playa site right off the island is pretty short, getting from my access point up here to these four sampling sites is like a 20 to 25 mile loop. Uh, and we do do it mainly on foot. So although it's a workout, it's really worth it. It's really cool research and I'm excited to get back out there. Anyway, there are a few key differences to consider about my sites in the playa. Um, this site S, uh, short for Syracuse, is the closest site to roads, residential areas, landfills, farms. Um, the mosquito, air, air, mosquito abatement airstrip is right there. Um, so I expect to see contamination there for sure. It's the closest site to um, human activities. On the other end of the spectrum, although the site is close to Antelope, there's not a lot of development there. You know, there's that road running along it. So site A is the farthest away from Salt Lake City and the metro area probably less likely to be polluted. Uh, and then over to the east, there are three sites that uh, received some substantial flooding with water from the Jordan River, which washes in a bunch of fine river sediments, dissolved constituents, um, whatever water drained out of Utah Lake. Stormwater runoff from Provo and Salt Lake City. So uh, in summary, it's not the cleanest water in the world. And uh, I would expect that dust coming off the playa where these over for these flooded areas is also contaminated to some degree. Uh, from my monthly collections between June and September in 2019 and 2020, I've found that Site S doesn't actually produce very much dust. Uh, considering it's the closest to residential areas, this is a bit of a relief. So we don't have our most um, highly productive dust site also being the closest to residential areas. On the other hand, I found that on a few of my collection periods, production was extremely low, almost as low as site S. So that was kind of interesting um, to find. And I think that this variability has to do with influence from saltating sand grains, as I showed you earlier. Maybe these are eroding from Antelope Island and being transported to the playa um, and disrupting the, the playa sediments there. If the wind never gets strong enough to initiate saltation though, then sand grains don't bounce around the playa and dust production here may re be remaining very low. As for the other three sites, uh, they were somewhere in between, but definitely didn't vary month to month as much as site A did. But there was a major change between 2019 and 2020. Uh, last year, dust production from site L was way higher, which maybe reflects the gradual wearing down of protective surface crusts in that part of the playa. Site L is definitely closer to human populations than Site A, so it's a concern to see that it could be becoming dustier over time in this area of the playa. But we'll have to wait and see what this year shows us. Uh, moving on to the composition of the dust, a general trend is that Site S has the highest content of most heavy metals, while Antelope has the lowest. And like the amount of dust produced, the three flooded sites on the eastern part of the playa are somewhere in between. For some heavy metals, it sort of looks like that there's concentrations potentially decreasing the farther the site is from the Jordan River outlet, or maybe from the Kennecott mine and smelter. So as you can see here, uh, F is purple, K a little bit farther away is orange, and then L in yellow, is the furthest from the river outlet or from Kennecott. Uh, Syracuse is still high and Antelope is the lowest. And this is the same situation for copper and for zinc. 
Uh, chromium, copper, and zinc have many anthropogenic sources, such as waste disposal and landfills, pesticides, metal finishing. Uh, and become, because Site S is closest to a lot of these types of activities, it is, again, not a big surprise that it's most enriched in these metals. Plus, thinking back to the dust flux calculations, it's kind of the best case scenario that most the most polluted site, for now at least, is generating the least amount of dust. But in the case of lead, Syracuse is not the most enriched, which might support the hypothesis that is influenced by different types of pollution sources than the other sites. Again, um, we can see that concentrations are perhaps decreasing with distance from either the river outlet or Kennecott. Uh, lead is often associated with mining processes. So I would expect particulate emissions or wastewater drained from Kennecott and the surrounding mining district to be enriched in lead. Finally, the biggest geochemical difference is for thallium, which is a highly toxic metal that can easily enter the body through potassium uptake pathways. Thallium is also associ often associated with mining activities. So my hypothesis is that the playa near antelope receives metal particulates from smelting. Okay thallium and other metal pollution sources in just a few minutes. First, I have one last category of preliminary findings to share. My forward trajectory modeling has shown that air masses passing over the Farmington Bay Playa are often from the south, which means that dust eroded from the playa and suspended in these air masses are likely deposited over the northern suburbs of Salt Lake City, Ogden and Northern Wasatch, and potentially Logan in the Bear River Range. But the playa also experiences northwesterly winds, which can transport playa dust to the east over the Wasatch. Taken together, uh, how have these different types of results shaped my ongoing work and research goals? Uh, first of all, I'm going to continue monitoring dust production rates and modeling potential transport pathways for the next two years. Considering the dominant trans transport pathways identified, these efforts will also involve setting up dust samplers in Cache Valley and the Wasatch Mountains. It has already been identified that Great Salt Lake Playa dust reaches the Wasatch, but we don't really know how much in comparison to other regional dust sources like the West Desert. And it's a big question mark as to whether dust from the Great Salt Lake Playa affects like me and Janice up here in Logan. Another question I have is whether the desiccation of the Great Salt Lake can explain changes in regional air quality. Inspired by some of Janice's research during her PhD, I'm starting to compile reports of low visibility events from weather stations across Northern Utah. And then I'm analyzing how the frequency of low visibility events has changed over time. Uh, some preliminary, preliminary work for Ogden, which is definitely downwind from the playa, shows pretty substantial increases beginning in the late 90s. But we don't yet know if this is in response to lower lake levels and increased dust production from the playa. As I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, deposition can have a big impact on snow water resources. But because weather reports only go back so far, I'm going to use different technique to determine how the amount of dust deposited to the Wasatch Mountains has changed over time. For this part of my project, I'll extract a sediment core from Farmington Lake, which if you've never been to is located up Farmington Canyon. Basically because the geochemical composition of playa dust or other regional dust sources will be really different from the composition of material weathered from the local bedrock, I will be able to measure having some freezing issues. I'm not sure what happened. Oh, oh hi, sorry. Um, I think my internet connection's not so good. Can everyone hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. I'll get right back to it. Oh, 
Okay. So I will be able to measure how much dust has been deposited to that area over time and relate those changes to water use, land use, intensification, and climate. Last, I have two major questions regarding heavy metals in Great Salt Lake Playa dust, which I'll just kind of zoom through real quickly here. What are the sources of heavy metals to the playa? Of course, when I measure them, I'm curious where they're coming from. I know that three of the sites are impacted by flooding from polluted waterways. So this summer I will collect diff water from different points along the river and industrial drainages. I will also deploy dust samplers at the southern tip of Antelope Island, directly downwind from the Kennecott smelter and tailings piles. I will analyze these potential source materials, not only for their heavy metal content, but for unique, but for unique isotope fingerprints which I will compare to the isotope fingerprints left at the crime scene, AKA the composition of the playa dust. This should help me understand why antelope is enriched in thallium and whether heavy metal contaminants are reaching the playa mainly through the watershed or through the airshed. And in another project, I shift from looking at human causes of heavy metal pollution to human consequences by testing how much dust from the Great Salt Lake playa can affect plants, specifically in this case, garden vegetables. Most people who have backyard gardens or use community gardens don't think about testing their soil or plants for heavy metals and probably couldn't afford the testing anyway. So this is a really important question to ask on behalf of folks living across the Wasatch Front. You know, can dust storms from the playa make my garden toxic? To address this concern, next winter I'll be conducting a greenhouse experiment where I expose commonly grown green, uh, garden vegetables to playa dust and measure heavy metal accumulation in their roots and edible parts. Coming from a geology background, this is my first time conducting a study with plants, so I'm pretty excited to be learning a lot of new things with this work. So that's it. These are my next steps. Uh, I know it's kind of a lot in a short amount of time. I'd love to give another talk like next year when I have more results to show and more answers to my research questions. But until then, thanks so much for listening. Sorry, I just disappeared for a minute. And maybe there's a minute or two left to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you so much, Molly. This is fascinating and really impressive. We have probably five minutes or so for questions. Plop them into the chat. So many different things to think about from that presentation. Um, I guess I have a question about the, as people kind of get warmed up about the um, potential for like changes over time. You mentioned that the soil crust could be degrading. Like how big of an issue do you think that potentially could be? Um, I think that uh, Dr. Kevin Perry made an estimate based on his analysis of different textures on the playa, and I think that it could increase, he's projected that it, the destruction of crusts could maybe increase the overall potential for the playa to produce dust by, I want to say like somewhere around 15%. I double check uh, if I pull up his report. But yeah, there's quite a bit of protective dust cover uh, overlaying sediments that are very fine and susceptible to um, being emitted as dust. So any kind of damage from even like raindrops, but definitely if people are driving like ATVs out there or just weathering over time exposure to wind precipitation can definitely make the playa more emissive. Well, very, very concerning indeed. <laughs> um, okay, you have a few questions here. So first from Gwen um, Christofferson, how big of a role do you think the dust plays in Salt Lake City's winter inversion? Um, so these, I, I would say probably not a whole lot in terms of the inversion. Um, there's 
inversions are really big in like December, January, and during those times, the playa is usually pretty moist with precipitation. Um, moisture does not uh, really mix with dust storms a lot. So if there's more moisture, the particles are being held together more. And in inversions, we're not seeing those really strong gusts that can generate dust storms. So um, in that case, uh, in an inversion, everything's kind of still and trapped and the humidity is high. But that said, um, you know, there are more particles just in the atmosphere around a dust source area. So I can't speak exactly to how um, some of those might be interacting with the other pollutants during inversion days. All right, I apologize for the dogs behind me, but uh, the next question is from Bonnie Baxter. Um, Bonnie says, very nice. I'm wondering if you're considering verifying the point sources. I wonder if transects um, from a hypothetical point source would help elucidate them. Yeah, definitely. Um, unfortunately, there's so many <laughs> sources and uh, there's also, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to um, figure out uh, sources of air day or from day to day. So it makes it a lot more complicated than like if you're looking at pollution transport in one stream, if that's the case, then, you know, something being dumped into the stream is going downstream. That's so super it's interesting. Yeah, for those of us who work in water, we don't think like that. So that's super interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, we have a lot of really great questions, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna keep moving through them. Um, but if I misrepresent your question as you've written it, jump in. Um, so Joy Emery is asking. Um, she says I haven't heard much about thallium in the valley. Is thallium reported in any other air studies around here too? I haven't seen um, any reports of thallium in um, in in air quality studies in the valley, but it is pretty tough to measure and is sometimes in really low concentrations. So it doesn't surprise me that we haven't, you know, seen many reports of it, but I'm, I'm excited to contribute to that and, and see if it is perhaps affecting the valley. Uh, it has been shown to bioaccumulate to really high levels in certain plants. So it would be a big concern if that's the case. Thanks. I was wondering, how did you decide to look for it? Was that just kind of something you figured you'd find or? Um, it was just actually kind of a coincidence that I met somebody um, through a colleague who is um, an expert in thallium and was hoping to test the use of thallium isotopes as a novel geochemical tracer. So not only is it a great place to test this out because there's um, because thallium is associated with mining activities. Um, it's also really cool because uh, thallium isotopes have never been used as tracers in dust studies. So uh, that's very exciting for us. And, and, and we you know, hope, hope that it might be useful for other pollution source studies and other dust research. Thank you. Really interesting. Um, Lynn is asking if thallium is um, also used in catalytic converters? Um, I think I remember reading that, but I would have to verify um, if, if anyone else knows. I know that it's oh, it says a yeah. poison in um, some TV shows I read today. So I can go back and check that. I think that's right. All right, then we have a, another question from Colin Robin, uh, Robinson. Do you think that dust from these lake beds compares to dust produced in um, the salt flats and desert of Great Salt Lake, how might the dust from um, the west of the lake affect the Wasatch Front? Like the, I guess uh, the salt flats out west. So um, in areas that are not covered with a protective salt crust, um, 
there is yeah definitely a lot of dust coming to the Wasatch Front and it's difficult to study um, like what's what's the difference between dust coming from the Great Salt Lake Playa and coming from a bit further west which is why isotopes can be really really useful. Uh, Greg Carling recently published a paper um, showing that there are small differences in the isotope, uh, strontium isotope composition of dust, for instance, from the severe dry lake playa and the Great Salt Lake playa. So if we can have more isotope studies um, using different isotope systems to detect differences in those different sources, then we have a better chance of understanding how much each of these is influencing the um, composition of the dust falling upon the Wasatch Front. Um, yes, isotopes. <laughs> um, all right, we have one more question from Jamie, and then um, uh, we'll probably have to move on to the, the final part of our program. Um, Jamie says, I'm usually the one collecting samples of the mud and salt, and if anybody asked me to take samples where you are, I'd probably quit my job. <laughs> Can you please describe what it's like to travel and walk um, to your sites? Do you sink in the mud? What cool things do you find? Um, it's, uh, I don't, <laughs> I'm a little caught off guard. Uh, great question. Uh, sometimes, yes, in the early season, I can sink in mud, but I've learned my lesson to walk around the mud or the wet parts um, and to never try to take a shortcut through Phragmites um, and always bring as much water as you can fit in your bag and lots and lots of electrolyte tablets. And uh, my, my collaborator Jeff and I have made many fun songs during our treks on the playa to keep morale high. I'm just curious, do you have to wear special, do you just wear regular wader boots or do you have to wear like snowshoes or how do you stay above the, the mud? Um, a lot of the time I'm just walking on dry playa sediments. So in, when walking through the mud, I've been wearing, I've worn sandals, I've worn rubber boots, um, a little bit of everything, but my go-to now is just sneakers. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Molly. Thanks so much. Really cool work, really important. Um, get in touch with Molly if you have more questions about her work and definitely follow what she's doing. Um, and with that, we're gonna move on to um, the final portion of our program. I'm gonna hand it over to Kelly Hanna from our board and he's gonna describe, he's going to kind of thank our sponsors and um, announce the winners of, from 2021. Um, first, thank you, Melissa and Molly, for uh, two great presentations and your work and the science um, uh, coming from more of an artist side of things. I really appreciate it and uh, the education and uh, very well done. Thank you. Um, so continuing on uh, behalf of friends of Great Salt Lake, um, I would love to honor the uh, and announce the 2021 Doyle Stevens Scholarship winners. Um, First 2021 undergraduate winner is Colin Robinson of Brigham Young University's Department of Molecular and Microbiology for his project titled Perchlorate Reducing Microbes in the Desert of Great Salt Lake are the Key to Rearing Plants on Mars. And uh, thank you for curiosity and perseverance for leading the way figuratively and literally. And Colin, congratulations. Uh, is there any, you're here, Colin, is there anything that you want to share with us? Any advanced insights or thoughts? I don't know, just stay tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, but it pretty much says it in the title there, Port Reducing Microbes, going to get us to Mars. Very excited to see that. Thank you and, and good luck with your work and so happy to be a part of Friends to help sponsor this research and your work. Uh, our 2021 graduate winner, graduate winner is Meg Wolf, who, who's not here this evening. She's of the University of Utah's Department of Geology and Geophysics for her project, When in Drought, Improving Snowmelt Water Supply Predictions in a Changing Climate in Great Salt Lake Water Supplying Catchment. 
I don't quite understand exactly what that means, but I am excited to find out and excited to hear from Meg. Um, so congratulations to her. And a special thanks to our judges uh, for 2021, Jim Harris, John Luft, Ryan Rowland, and Ella Sorensen. And uh, also to our 2021 donors and sponsors, uh, the Great Salt Lake Audubon, Great Salt Lake Brian Shrimp Cooperative, Vincy Giles, Bill Heeshan and Judy Gunderson, Susan and Spencer Martin, Carla and Charlie Trentelman, and Joanna and Terwada. Um, so thank you, heartfelt thank you to all of those folks, our judges and our sponsors. Yes. Um, a reminder that our 2021 winners will be speaking during next year's uh, Great Salt Lake Issues Forum. And put that in your calendar May 11th to the 13th next year at the Fort Douglas Officers Club on the campus of the University of Utah. Uh, so mark it in and hoping uh, we can all be there live and in person together um, sharing the love there. So thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you for your support of Friends of Great Salt Lake and protecting and preserving uh, our Great Salt Lake ecosystem. And, uh, and we bid you good night. Yay. Yay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all for coming. Love you. Good night. <laughs> good night.